the modern United States in, in demographic terms is very much a product, not exclusively, but certainly to, to a considerable extent of emigration from the German Reich. States and Migration in Europe podcast, welcome. Uh, today we have a, a very special guest, Professor Brendan Sims from Cambridge, the author of a recent biography of Hitler, Hitler Only the World Was Enough. It's connected with our uh, topic in this podcast, as uh, Professor Sims has well shown in his biography of Hitler, how migration shaped Hitler's uh, geopolitical thinking and explains a number of Hitler's actions. We will be discussing uh, the history of immigration uh, from Germany between the 18th to the early 20th century, how Hitler's uh, concern about immigration shaped his geopolitical thinking and the consequences of his attempts to, to, to manage uh, migration. So, uh, Brenda, uh, thank you very much for being here. That's a great honor to, to have you in this podcast. Uh, how are you? I'm very well, and thank you very much for asking me to join you. Before we get started, what, what drives your, your passion about this topic, and how did you come to, to study um, Hitler, German history, migration? Well, I suppose you could say the study of history was in my blood, in the sense that my grandfather, who started his career as a civil servant in India, he was part of the Indian civil service, um, after India became independent, as a second career, he became an historian. So there were always a lot of books uh, around the house. I inherited a lot of his books. So my mother, uh, uh, who's still alive, um, was a, a historical geographer uh, in Dublin. So I grew up with historical geography as well as straightforward history. So that, as a career path, uh, in, in a sense, I was following uh, in the footsteps uh, of my ancestors, you could say. And then there's the connections of family more generally, which I think you will find in, in almost any family, you'll have connections. So, so my German grandfather, uh, so on my mother's side, um, fought in the Second World War, uh, unfortunately, uh, for him and everybody else. Um, and there's a the whole story around uh, the flight of my uh, German family from what then became uh, the German Democratic Republic. And on my Irish side, a uh, family which uh, spread across uh, the continents, really. I mentioned India, but I've also had a, a great uncle in South Africa, um, a great uh, great aunt in Canada, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's nothing particularly special about that. Uh, that is is really the story of the 20th and the 21st century, uh, but it did help to animate my, my interest in history. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we see well uh, um, a family uh, legacy that connects uh, the study of history, uh, a German connection, and also a quite intensive uh, migration flows. So let's. So we have already started talking about uh, German immigration with, uh, with your, your grandfather. So let's delve a little bit into the topic of German immigration, maybe in, until precisely the, the, the situation in which your, your grandfather left uh, is Germany. So how important was immigration in German history in, from the 18th century until the beginning of the 20th century? Well, extremely important, uh, particularly from the early 19th century onwards. When, when Germans had been leaving uh, for particularly North America, um, really since the start of the colonization of the continent. And they've been leaving for many different reasons, for uh, religious reasons. So you'd, for example, Protestant Palatines fleeing persecution by Catholics, uh, late 17th, early uh, 18th century, for economic reasons uh, and for political reasons. It's really the size of the migration which is critical. Um, it's the German emigration is actually the largest um, immigration into the United States. We're talking about something like 6 million uh, plus Germans who leave uh, Germany between 1820 and 1914 uh, and go to, uh, go to the United States. It's actually the, the biggest single influx uh, in national terms into the, into the U.S. We were discussing this map uh, together on uh, the share of um, ancestry by county in the United States in 2010. Uh, and, and we can see very well on this map that 
German ancestry is the largest ancestry in, in the United States. We are trying to find older maps, but it seemed that uh, this kind of maps uh, started being uh, designed by the U.S. Census Bureau only uh, recently, around 2000, most probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's likely that if we were able to find a map uh, in uh, from 1900 or 1920, uh, precisely toward the time when uh, Hitler um, started thinking about the smarts, uh, it would have been even, even more even more dramatic. So, does this kind of map? match uh, this um, your your perspective on German immigration and the role that German immigration played in US in US um, history and US immigration. Yes, as you say, it's a very striking map. So it's a whole sea of red is the color chosen here. Um, and as you say, uh, where we'd have had a comparable map for 1900 or 1910, that would be an even bigger uh, field uh, of color showing the predominance of German uh, settlements. So there are whole um, uh, states in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and so on, which are completely dominated uh, by German migration. It goes all the way across from uh, the west to the east coast and uh, from the north, not quite to the south, because you then get into predominantly um, African-American uh, areas in terms of, of, of the, uh, the relative majority uh, of origin. But I think it does illustrate um, the point, which is that uh, the modern United States in, in demographic terms is very much a product, not exclusively, but certainly to, to a considerable extent of emigration from the German right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we have... Uh, uh... Maybe a, a concrete example of the of those immigrants in the in the the family of of Donald Trump. Have you been working on the, on uh, on his genealogy? You no. Know? Uh. Yes. So um, I mean, the list of German Americans is 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 long uh, and in some cases distinguished, and in some cases uh, controversial. So one thinks, for example, of uh, President Eisenhower. Uh, of course, the commander of uh, Allied Force of Europe and subsequently president in the 1950s, who was the descendant of, of Mennonites, so religious refugees from Germany, if you like. Um, but you're alluding to uh, Donald Trump, uh, whose um, grandfather, uh, Friedrich Drumpf, uh, uh, emigrated uh, in the late 19th century. In fact, he arrived at Ellis Island uh, and was rechristened uh, Frederick uh, Trump. Um, so uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, is, is very much also part uh, of this uh, great German uh, migration. And uh, it should be remarked that um, Donald Trump is, is pretty anti-German in his comments and outlook. And that is not at all unusual for the general trend of German-American uh, political opinion, which really after the traumatic moment of, of 1917, 1918, when the United States entered uh, the First World War, uh, many German Americans really broke with the old country at that point. So uh, origins uh, in Germany, German descent, is not in the same way a badge of honor or something you remark on uh, that you might, for example, if you're an Irish American uh, or some other background. Yes, that's that's particularly interesting. And here we start approaching what is your 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 big argument in in the book, and which is that, and it was also Hitler's uh, Hitler's perspective, as we shall see, that those German immigrants were somehow lost uh, to Germany. So what what you have just said is that this. Um, the cut took place somewhere around 1917 when the United States uh, entered the war. But in contrast to uh, to British immigration, the, I understand that German immigration served to populate a, a territories that had no relationship whatsoever politically with uh, with Germany. Mm. Whereas, even though uh, the the United States uh, took independence from from the United Kingdom, there were still extensive links between the two countries. And you also mentioned earlier uh, uh, 
the other parts of the Commonwealth. So uh, German immigration occurred in territories where German political influence was absolutely absent. Do you think it can explain this, um, the fact that German immigration was lost to Germany? And what was uh, what was the concern about this loss in German among German elites at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century? Well, so I mentioned that we're talking about millions of, of immigrants. So there's a quantitative concern that, that Germany is just losing uh, workforce, losing potential uh, soldiers and recruits. Uh, but it's also a qualitative concern. Uh, th there's a, a general agreement in the discourse, and Hitler, by the way, also was of this view, interestingly enough, which is that uh, immigrants tend to be uh, the most active um, and the most gecko, if you like, uh, elements of the population. And so you have, you have this sense, at least among some elements, and certainly on Hitler's side, that in a sense, the best, um, the best forces, the best demographic uh, forces within Germany are, are, are hemorrhaging out of the country. Um, and, are, and this was a phrase that was used at the time, and particularly also by Hitler, are fertilizing. Fertilizing, so dünger, as you leave in dünger, they provide the fertilizer for other countries, and and of course, the United States is the main receptacle. But as you mentioned, uh, the British Empire is also very important. So large numbers of Germans go to Australia. In fact, uh, I had a great, uh, great uh, grand uh, uh, grandmother who uh, was a German from Australia who came to live in uh, the first and then came back to Ireland, for instance. Um, or they went to Canada, um, or they went to uh, uh, some of them also New Zealand, uh, South Africa, uh, fewer. Most of them went to um, the United States. Um, and so the concern is that these uh, these elements have been lost to the Reich. And it's it's quite an important theme in the Second Empire. Uh, so people like uh, Paul Rohrbach, for example, who was a big uh, enthusiast and pr propagandist for German imperial expansion, quite explicitly. Um, says that a major reason for this expansion is to provide Germany with colonies which can soak up the demographic overflow and prevent it uh, from uh, uh, advantaging potential rivals of the German Reich. And indeed, uh, there were, for example, in the 1920s, uh, in a place like Munich, there are actually newspapers uh, devoted to uh, emigration. So it's a, it's a big theme. I mean, Germany... The bottom line is that Germany in the 19th uh, and the early 20th century was basically an emigration country. It wasn't an immigration country. There was a net outflow rather than net inflow, which, of course, is something uh, uh, we don't really think of today because we have a picture, quite rightly, of Germany as a country to which people went. But actually, in the time we're talking about, um, it was a country from which people emigrated. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, as we as we shall see, it's um, Hitler's attempt to fix this issue were not successful. As we can see on on this graph, the uh, the preparedness to immigrate from Germany was quite high, uh, even after the Second World War. Yeah, it's from 1948. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see that uh, almost 43% of men in West Berlin wanted to wanted to emigrate is still in 1948. But uh, one could make the argument also that, uh, again, that the UK also experienced quite a significant amount of immigration. And, um, and uh, for the UK, it was a way to project power, uh, whereas for Germany, it seemed to be a way to lose power. So do you confirm that it has all to do with colonial institutions that made that once a country belonged uh, nominally to, to, to the UK or, or to Germany, then its immigration would serve to reinforce uh, the country of origin. Do you, do you think this was something real or this elite in the Second Reich may have overestimated uh, this aspect? Um, so, I mean, do you think that uh, they were really losing something? Mm. Or yeah, is something. it 1917 yeah. that, that really made them lose those people? No, I mean, they, they lost them, if you like, twice over. They lost them uh, demographically in the 19th 
early 20th century, and then they lost them politically uh, with uh, the American entry into the First World War. Um, and the way you can you can see this uh, is if you look at the 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 case of the British Empire. Um, you know, so so you're quite right to say that there's a large outflow from the British Isles, and quite a bit of that, certainly on the Irish side, goes to to the United States, but most of it goes to the British Empire and then is deployed, um, is retrieved, if you like in the context of imperial war. So during the Boer War, for example, you have forces sent from Australia, from Canada. Um, you read accounts of the Boer veterans. I mean, like Dennis Rates, for example, in his famous book, Commander, he talks about how depressing it was, you know, uh, that to find that every, every week a new troop ship would arrive from some part of the Commonwealth, bringing more and more people who'd, who'd signed up just to fight them in South Africa. And then, of course, when you come to the First World War, if you think of the contribution, particularly of the Anzacs, the Australians and New Zealanders in Gallipoli uh, fighting the Turks, but also uh, often overlooked, there are plenty of Australians on the Western Front as well. Then you have the Canadians who basically, you know, fight the Battle of Vimy Ridge, Passchendaele. It's a huge input. So uh, that, I think, was an example of how the demographic outflow then uh, comes as a reverse flow back into Europe during the First World War. And of course, for the Germans, that reverse flow was hostile. And that was the thing that Hitler was really worried about. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, this aspect uh, on uh, the, the role of uh, the, the capacity of the UK to, to, to get those people back in certain circumstances. That's, that really highlights indeed our, our immigration could be lost for Germany and, and not for the UK. And this is where Hitler uh, came of age, uh, with the, with the environment in which uh, in which he, he, he grew up. But uh, maybe just before we we, we we delve into his geopolitical thinking, Hitler was an immigrant himself because he, he grew up in in Austria and, and and joined Germany. Did he did Hitler ever consider himself as a, as an immigrant? No, of course not. I mean, he regarded himself as a German. And uh, in his mind, he was engaging in internal migration. So he was moving within the German space. And of course, he volunteered for the German Imperial Army, not for the uh, Habsburg, uh, uh, Kaiserlich and, and, and Königlich Army in, in 1914. Uh, but you're right to say that his uh, national and, and, and citizenship status was contested. I mean, he actually spent a period stateless um, and he had some difficulties actually getting a German uh, passport. Um, but those are the, if you like, the formal bureaucratic facts. But in terms of his own self-understanding, he didn't consider himself uh, an immigrant. He considered himself a German who had moved between different parts of, of what was Germany or what should be Germany. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so um, when reading uh, your book, we, we see that Hitler really had a, a, a confrontation with this reality we were describing uh, during World War I. Uh, uh, there was a, an episode in which he came across uh, U.S. soldiers of German ancestry. What, what, what did the shock that, that revealed this predicament to Hitler? Yes. So uh, in uh, July, the middle of July, it's to be precise, the 18th of July, uh, 1918, Hitler uh, comes across or he, he's, he, he takes prisoner to Americans uh, who he drops off at brigade headquarters. And we know that this incident happened because we actually have the document uh, from one of his commanders referring to it. It's in the uh, Bavarian military archive in Munich. I was the one who actually found that document, uh, which shows that you, you're always learning new things about Hitler. Um, and uh, why this is important is not so much the actual incident uh, itself. It, it, it happened at the height of the Second Battle of the Marne, which was really the moment at which the Americans got involved in turning the tide um, in France um, towards the end of the First World War. But the reason why it's significant politically and geopolitically is because Hitler comes back to this incident on many occasions uh, in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, and what he says 
is that these two Americans, or what he claims is that these two Americans were of German origin. And he refers to the moment in 1918 when he when the German armies on the Western Front uh, encountered the children of emigrants from Germany. And he says they are blonde and blue-eyed and they've returned to fight uh, the fatherland. Now, whether they were blonde or blue-eyed, uh, that we absolutely can't tell. Um, but what is clear is that what had lodged itself in his mind was that he was now fighting the demographic outflow from Germany, which had come back uh, as enemies of the right. And this causes him to question then uh, Germany's foreign policy up to this point and to develop a whole strategy uh, designed to deal with the problem. Exactly like uh, the British were able to, to uh, gather from various parts of the empire soldiers to fight in the Boer War, the, 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 the same was taking place uh, in the First World War, of course, and, and but this time against Germany, and this were German immigrants fighting Germany. So, uh, so Hitler was making this this calculation, this strategic calculation in his mind at that time. That is, they, they, they leave the country and they come back to fight us. And moreover, as he was saying, you the best come back to fight us. Mm -hmm. So he, he tried, so this is in this context and his experience during the First World War that he, he starts developing, uh, I understand, his, his geopolitical thinking around the uh, the the late 10s, the late teens, and early twenties, he, he, he develops um, a geopolitical thinking. He starts looking east in order to solve this predicament. Yeah, from Hitler's point of view, the the real problem, or one of the problems, uh, critical problems in Germany, but for our purposes here, the real problem is that Germany lacked space. Um, it lacked space because it hadn't developed an overseas empire. Uh, in the 16th, 17th century, the moment when others, particularly the British, were doing that, was starting out on this path. And why was it not doing that? Because it was internally divided. It was fragmented through the Reformation, through the religious wars. And that fragmentation then, in his view, persists to the modern period. So it becomes a fragmentation not just around religion, but also around particularism, regional differences within Germany, it's a fragmentation around class, it's a fragmentation around ideology, uh, party movements, and, and, and so on. Um, and so his view is that uh, in order to, uh, to survive, Germany is going to have to in some way imitate what the British and what the Americans have done. In other words, uh, to secure a large amount of space which enables your race to develop. So Hitler's view is that the German people are actually made up of several different racial elements, only one of which, the Nordic element, he considers to be uh, truly superior. There are other elements, Slavic elements, Alpine elements, and so on. We're not talking here about Jews. We're not talking here about the so-called uh, undesirables and, uh, and those who have no right to live and so on. We're talking about those elements who are unquestionably part of the German nation, the German folk, the German people, but who are not, in fact, members uh, of the Nordic race, which he thinks is, if you like, a cream on the top of the, the bottle. Um, and the way in which you develop your uh, racial quality uh, can take different forms. It can be to do with cultural activity, it can be to do with other forms, but the main way you develop racially, in Hitler's view, is through territorial expansion and through war, through a constant process of engagement and strife. And this is what's happened, in his view, in the American West uh, and with the British Empire in places like India, which have then enabled the development of what he calls the master race. So the only time I've ever found Hitler using the word master race myself was in the context of the British, uh, the Anglo-Saxons, whom he considered to be uh, the true uh, master race. Um, and so what you needed to do was to gain space to develop the race. Um, and as you say, he decides to uh, secure this space 
to the east of Germany. He wasn't entirely sure at first about this. Um, like many people, uh, I think he did flirt with the idea of overseas colonies. But for him, the experience of the First World War was that actually the British, the Royal Navy will simply cut you off from your, your colonies. And anyway, that the world globally had been distributed. And therefore, what you needed was a large amount of space, um, which was contiguous with the German right. So you couldn't be cut off by the Royal Navy, and you could create a sufficiently large critical mass, which would enable you not to dominate the British and the Americans, but to become a, a viable co-equal project in the running of the world. That is what uh, he wanted. Um, and that is why he developed his, his so-called Lebensraum concept uh, of territorial uh, expansion uh, in the East. So the reason why he fixates uh, on the Soviet Union is not because the Jews, who are his ideological uh, enemy and another form of racial enemy, are, 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 are dominant there in the Bolshevik regime, but rather because Russia is weak, having a Bolshevik regime will render it um, vulnerable to the kind of takeover that he has in mind. Mm. That's fascinating, though. Hitler was looking forward to territorial expansion, both as a way to transfer there the surplus of population of Germany so that this surplus doesn't go elsewhere. And as a way also to improve the race. It was, it was his view that it's in this process of expansion that the race is improved, correct? Exactly right. So he, he conceives of, and he says this explicitly, he conceives of uh, the, the territorial empire, this new territorial empire in Russia, um, in Ukraine, basically, and, and parts of Western Russia. Um, he perceives, he calls this, you know, this, this will be our uh, Mississippi will be on the Volga. Um, <laughs> and he specifically <laughs> says that he hopes that it will uh, soak up the demographic overflow from Germany, and perhaps also some elements from, uh, you know, the low countries, from, from, from Holland, um, and also maybe some people returning from America, uh, German Americans returning uh, from the United States, although he's never really very optimistic uh, about that. Um, but he's conceiving of this space as something which is analogous to uh, the colonization of the American West. Hitler seemed to be quite informed about the history of Europe over the previous centuries. And uh, this idea of, uh, uh, of the improvement of the race in the expansion reminds me of uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. Did had, uh, Hitler read him? Uh, but Turner did not really think in terms of race. It was more in terms of character. But was it kind of similar thought he, he was developing, but instead of applying it to culture and character, he would apply it to race? So the, the problem with Hitler is, um, obviously among many problems, is that he relatively rarely cited a specific, a specific author. And so quite often you just have to infer from the context or the argumentation what the source might be. Um, and this is done generally very, very well in the edition, for example, of Mein Kampf, uh, published by the uh, huge two-volume commentary uh, and edition published by the Institute for Zeitgeschichte uh, in Munich. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so far as I'm aware, Frederick Jackson Turner was not among the influences that they had located. I certainly didn't see any reference. He does mention other Americans. Uh, so, for example, uh, Madison Grant, who was American racial theorist, um, and wrote a book in, in 1916, notorious book, which was called The Passing of a Great Race. Um, he does cite Madison Grant. And what's interesting is that he actually endorses uh, Grant's view, which was controversial, within Germany, that uh, the Germans were probably not the best immigrant material into the United States. Um, Grant's view was that the best immigrants came from the British Isles, and the Germans and the Scandinavians, uh, but particularly the Germans, were a bit further down. Uh, and this caused quite considerable offense in German right-wing and racist circles. Hitler, interestingly enough, says that Madison Grant is right. <laughs> um, 
which reflects, I think, Hitler's view that uh, essentially the superiority of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, they're really the, the, the racial element uh, which you're going to have to, to prevail against if you're going to survive in this competitive world of great powers. Here I understand uh, we are talking about the early 1920s. This is approximately when these various thoughts settled down in Hitler's mind. And um, perhaps the uh, spectacle of uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, embroiled in a civil war made it an, as an, attract an attractive prey for Hitler's expansionist ambitions. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. And I think I need to stress here, of course, that anti-Semitism is very important to Hitler's worldview. I mean, we're talking now about, we have been talking about uh, emigration and Lebensraum and the geopolitics of all of that, which doesn't, in every case, directly involve the Jews. But I wouldn't want your viewers or listeners to come away thinking that we don't uh, consider uh, anti-Semitism very important. But uh, what I think is true to say is that the Anti-Semitism here is important and it's in a different way. It's, it's important as a, a, an anxiety around the domestic corruption and fragmentation of Germany, which is aggravating uh, and to a certain extent causing, in Hitler's view, Germany's disadvantaged position uh, within the world. Um, but even without the Jews, he still has all the anxieties uh, I've referred to uh, with regard to emigration and the Anglo-Saxons. And he sees the Jews and Bolshevism uh, not as a foreign policy threat. So the Soviet, his concern with the Soviet Union in the 1920s is not a, a, an invasion by the Red Army of the German Reich. What he's worried about is that internal subversion by communists and by, allegedly by Jews will render Germany defenseless against the takeover by the forces of international capitalism and the forces of, of the Entente of Britain and France and, and, and also uh, the associated power, uh, the United States. That's what he's worried about. And he gets territorially fixated on the Soviet Union because, as I say, he believes that Bolshevism has hollowed out the Soviet Union and in turn rendered it ripe for takeover uh, by the Germans. So it's actually the weakness of the Bolshevik Soviet Union that is 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 um, uh, is in his focus, uh, not so much the military threat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the, at this moment. Yeah, yeah, and obviously, yeah. What we are doing here is trying to understand how the thread of the migration predicament uh, shaped Hitler's geo overall geopolitical thinking, and it shaped it quite extensively, as we have just seen. Mm -hmm. uh, other aspects of his, uh, it doesn't mean that it explains all the aspects of his mind. I, my opinion is that the, his hatred of the Jews went beyond that. There was probably something else also that triggered it, and uh, you, you refer to that in the book as well. But let's let's keep our thread uh, for for now. And so we have seen how it, the predicament of immigration in Germany, how Hitler uh, became aware of this predicament, and how this aspect shaped his overall geopolitical thinking somewhere until the early 1920s. Then let's fast forward until the 1930s when uh, Hitler really came to power and uh, started implementing his, um, his strategy. So do you think that uh, Hitler's attempt at conquest and at wars of uh, subjugation, annexation, first in Poland and then later in the Ukraine, uh, were really still driven by his, uh, the previous considerations we have mentioned, namely finding uh, settlement opportunities for Germans and forging uh, the, the German race. Very much so. Uh, and it's important, I think, to realize that the attack on Poland is not in the first instance um, a territorial uh, demographic land grab. Um, his initial hope had been that he could ally with Poland. Poland is generally conceived of by Hitler prior to September 19, or let's say the summer of 1939, 
as a as a potential uh, partner in the despoliation um, of the Soviet Union. Um, and it's only when Poland refused to do that, as then guaranteed uh, in March, April 1939, uh, that Hitler then uh, comes of the view that he needs to deal with the British and the French, and he needs to uh, eliminate uh, Poland on the way. Uh, so it will then be a staging ground for the attack on the Soviet Union. But the, the Lebensraum itself um, is to be seized in, uh, in the Soviet Union, in Ukraine, uh, and in Western Russia, uh, not in Poland. That's the original conception. And when he implements this vision from late 39, 1939 onwards, it is very much driven by the same motivations that drive him in the 1920s. In other words, um, he is contemplating the antipathy of uh, the British Empire, the antipathy from October 1937 uh, of uh, President Roosevelt, who, of course, has, has made the famous uh, quarantine speech, bracketing the German Reich along with Mussolini's Italy and Imperial Japan as the enemy of civilization and of, uh, of world peace. Um, Hitler thinks, well, I now really have to speed up uh, this process of territorial uh, gain. Um, and also, I need to secure uh, the resources that will enable me to outlast uh, the British blockade. And that's a very important part also um, of the attack of the Soviet Union uh, in 1941. So the, the, the framing, the, the strategic framing around Operation Barbarossa is primarily around the securing of Lehman's Ram and the um, uh, securing of uh, raw materials and foodstuffs. Um, the the, the anti-Bolshevik element and the mass murder of the Jews, uh, which follow, uh, is part of the operational implementation of that plan. But you won't read anywhere in Mein Kampf or anywhere else in the 1920s that we need to invade the Soviet Union in order to eliminate the Jews. We need to invade the Soviet Union, he argues, in order to secure a living space. That's the strategic objective. <laughs> and yeah, I was thinking in terms of, of time, because is uh, you were referring to the Volga, will be the Mississippi River, to the expansion of the British Empire. These were developments that took uh, that took centuries, sometimes or at least uh, at least uh, several decades. Yep. And so, to what extent was Hitler trying to accelerate time in in this process? Or, and to what extent that would be the counter argument? Was he still trying to have a massive robbery of resources, foodstuff, uh, oil fields, uh, in order to, to secure his, his back against the Anglo Americans? Well, the two are not mutually exclusive, of course, but you put your finger on a really important aspect, which is quite prominent in, in my book, which is the time factor. And Hitler's conception of time actually it oscillates. So there are moments in the 20s when he thinks that, um, in fact, he's not even going to take over uh, power himself. He will simply be somebody who will be a kind of John the Baptist figure, a drummer was the phrase he used and was used of him. Um, uh, and um, uh, that he would pave the way for some future messiah. Then he starts thinking just before the 1923 coup, well, maybe I can do it. Uh, that, of course, fails. Um, then he goes to a longer timeline. Um, and so there is, there's a certain sense in the 1930s of, on the one hand, there's an urgency. On the other hand, um, he is arguing in terms of long-term transformations um, and that you'll begin in Germany, you'll begin by uh, improving the living standard, which is very important in his mind for improving uh, so-called racial quality. And then when you come to, to the late 1930s, and as I say, the, the growing antipathy of the United States and the British Empire, he then speeds up. And this has a consequence for the racial policy because you move from a more evolutionary uh, a policy of excluding Jews uh, to a more radical uh, revolutionary policy of, of murder. Um, uh, and then on the uh, living space front, uh, you move then 
to to speeding up the acquisition acquisition of living space. Um, so uh, time is very very important. The less time Hitler thinks he has, the more radical his actions are. That's a general general rule. And. Uh... Indeed, and under this pressure of time, he, he, he faced he faced uh, serious disappointments in his attempt to to manage migration. So he he, he was expecting that he would uh, conquer territories and that this would take up the demographic surplus of Germany, perhaps uh, bring back some of the German immigrants uh, from from North America, and this uh, this fails. Dramatically, around 1940 until 1942. Uh, so um, there was this line that he, he thought he had a people without a space. He ended up with a space without a people. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So there, there are many different stories, um, sort of uh, embraced by this general uh, characterization, which you've just um, uh, repeated. Um, in the sense that he he acquires a non-trivial number of Germans in the context of certain policy moves in 1939-1940. So, for instance, uh, in 1939, he concludes an agreement with Mussolini over South Tyrol, where he basically says South Tyrol is going to be part of uh, Italy, and the South Tyrolese Germans uh, have to opt either to be Italians, in which case they should stop complaining, uh, is Hitler's argument, or they can become Germans, in which case they have to, re- invert a commas, return to Germany. So he gets, uh, uh, you know, hundred thousands of uh, South Tyrolo- Tyrolians on the strength of that. Uh, then after the agreement with Stalin in the Hitler-Stalin Pact in August 1939, there are agreements for the inverted commas return of Germans from Volinia, from the Baltic states and other places. So he has them. Um, so he uses them uh, to the large extent to put them in territories captured in Poland, which originally he hadn't actually been planning to settle. The Lebensraum, as I said, is really in Ukraine and Western Russia. So that is an attempted solution. The problem. Uh, really is, first of all, that Germany, because it is now a war economy, suffers hugely from labor shortages. So there actually isn't a demographic overflow. Quite the opposite. There is a huge demand for labor. And it's a great irony that it's during the Second World War that Germany becomes, in fact, uh, the greatest country of immigration uh, uh, for the first time. Of course, uh, now it's even more so. Um, but this inflow of slave workers and semi-voluntary workers and others, uh, particularly from 1941-42 onwards, is, is quite important. And Hitler hadn't really foreseen that. The second factor is that um, being settled in Poland or even worse from their point of view in, in, in you know, somewhere in, in Ukraine or in Crimea or whatever, is deeply unattractive to most Germans. Um, this is not the life uh, you would want to lead. Um, most people want to live in, in a large city uh, and uh, not to be exposed to partisan attacks and so on. So uh, the settlement plan is a complete flaw. It's a failure. This pins down what was wrong in Hitler's approach to to. To migration management, he did not manage to to <laughs> to manage migration uh, actually. So. Why did people not want to go there? Whereas they, you could say they, they went to, to because it was all the, this were all the times. It was no longer the time of the frontier in the United States. Uh, why did it fail? So, you know, if we're asking what was wrong with Hitler's approach to migration, one is tempted, of course, to say obviously everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, everything almost, well, pretty much everything Hitler does or says is in some sense wrong. And then I, you know, we wouldn't want to be misunderstood as suggesting otherwise. But to answer your question within the, you know, the sense in which you asked it, um, I, I think the problem is that uh, 
yes, the 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 generation of the 1940s is not like um, the generation of the 19th century, which is fleeing economic hardship, which is fleeing uh, political persecution, but it's mainly economic. Um, so the, the, the economic push factors uh, in the German Reich in 1941 to 42, which is when this would have been relevant, uh, are minuscule. People are paid relatively large wages. There's a shortage of, um, of labor, as I've said. Uh, German workers are a kind of aristocracy over the, uh, uh, the foreign workers. Um, there is really absolutely no reason for anybody to, to take off from the big population centers uh, of the rural um, uh, or Upper Silesia or whatever, um, and to go and live a, a, an arduous and hazardous life uh, in, in Russia or, or in Ukraine. Um, and if you're in a sort of poor and rural part of Germany, then you're more likely to move to uh, one of those jobs in the in the war economy um, in the population centers in Germany. Again, despite various incentives, you're unlikely to go east. So the incentive structure was just completely different uh, yeah. from the, the migration flows of the 19th century. Yeah, it it shows the failure of a top-down management of uh, of migration flows, which moreover it conceived in terms of uh, the economy of the 19th century. Whereas in a more industrialized economy, less agricultural uh, economy, with also some uh, the development of major uh, major urban centers, uh, the the dynamic of migration flows was no longer the same as it used to be in the 19th century. And so his antiquated ideas and his, um, his forceful management of migration flows uh, collapsed against, uh, against this reality. And to what extent did it play a role in the ultimate collapse of Hitler's project? Well, I, I think, you know, migration, in a sense, is his downfall because he's beaten by the Anglo-Saxon powers. So he's, he's, he's experienced exactly the same thing as the German Reich has experienced in the First World War. So he, he wants to avoid Hitler, uh, history repeating itself, but he actually brings on the very combination that he wants to avoid. And it's a great irony that a huge proportion of those coming certainly from the United States were of mm. German descent. Um, so I mentioned Eisenhower already, but I think of the commander of the Air Force in Europe, uh, General Spatz, uh, was of German descent. And in the book, I, I give a long list of mm -hmm. generals who are commanding in the Northwestern theater, uh, fighting Germany. Um, and Hitler himself is conscious of this. He refers on several occasions during the war to uh, the fact that Germany is fighting its own emigrants um, and indeed fighting its own engineers. It was particularly remarkable incident in, in the summer of 1944, when, of course, the German war economy is, is producing at a very high level, but it's being clobbered uh, um, by the Anglo-Americans from the air, uh, and of course, it's being outproduced uh, by the West as well. And Hitler says to the leaders of the German war economy, I know you're very worried about all these German engineers uh, working for the Americans, uh, but don't worry, I have German engineers as well. Which, is, which would be a very strange comment um, if you didn't understand the context which we've just been discussing, uh, which is of this great outflow of German talent, uh, which is now uh, basically uh, reinforcing and fueling uh, the Allied war effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So we, we, we have completed the, the journey of uh, Hitler's thinking about, about migration. And so you... you I, I really encourage everybody who has not yet done it to, to, to read your book, which is a fascinating and innovative uh, biography of Hitler, which shows how uh, migration impacted his, his geopolitical thinking. So you, you managed to, to, to draft a book that is both very innovative and has also triggered a significant debate among, uh, among historians. And uh, and that has broad public uh, appeal. As 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 a historian, which advice would you give to to um, 
to, to historians, uh, to young historians especially, uh, to, to combine these uh, innov innovative aspects and also uh, the broad public appeal of, of this narrative? Well, I think if you're an academic historian, a young academic historian, what I would recommend is that one um, uh, publishes the first book and possibly also the second book on a more narrowly defined traditional uh, scholarly topic. So to establish your credentials as a scholar uh, and then move to something that might have a wider uh, appeal uh, to the public, but of course, you know, um, conducted according to the scholarly principles. Um, and I think what you would do then is what you need to do is to find a gap. Um, you need to find a topic that will be of public interest. That is, is uh, not every topic that will be. Um, and then you have to be lucky. Um, you have to be lucky in terms of timing, perhaps. Uh, so, and you have you have to be skilled uh, in the way in which you go about it. Um, so, an example I would cite. Um, a book I like very much by my colleague Claire Jackson, who is an early modern historian of Britain. Uh, she published a book last year called, uh, or in fact, the year before last, called Devil Land. And it's about 17th century Britain and the travail of 17th century Britain. And it's in many ways, it's a, it's a, a story uh, which is, 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 is rooted, obviously, in the century itself uh, about all the trouble with Scotland and Ireland and religion and so on. But what I think made the book so attractive and, and, and helps explain part of its success is that it's not merely an excellent work of history. It also seemed to explain to many people uh, England, Britain's um, difficulties with Europe, difficulties with itself at a time of Brexit. So many of the stories that she told resonated with people's experience around Brexit. So, as I say, it's a question of timing. Um, it's a question of contexts. Um, and she'd have obviously herself also established herself uh, as a, as a uh, scholarly historian um, of Britain before that. So that's the way I would suggest going about it. I, I wouldn't dive in immediately into a, 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 a Nabirta Karma's popular book. I mean, it might work, but I think it's more, you're more likely to be successful if you take it at a gentler pace. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting approach. And, and your book to, to does resonate with the present in the sense that it closes um, it closed an episode of migratory imperialism and led to a new period in which uh, migration stopped being closely connected to imperialism as it used to be in Hitler. Hitler's, uh, Hitler learned the hard way that he was closing the door of this um, of this historical period. So, uh, Brendan Sims, thank you very much. It was a great honor to to have you talk to us about this uh, this fascinating question, the role of migration in Hitler's um, geopolitical thinking and uh, and his ultimate uh, failure. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye.